Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel. Which one of these gentlemen do you think is a millionaire? It very well could be a trick question. Perhaps it's all of them. Let's kick it off with Ronald Reed. Ronald has quite possibly the best Wikipedia intro you will ever read. It states, Ronald James Reed was an American philanthropist, investor, janitor, and gas station attendant. Not the kind of bio you read on a daily basis. Ronald worked as a gas station attendant and mechanic at the Haviland service station in Vermont for roughly 25 years. And during his tenure there, he and his brother actually ended up buying the place and he subsequently sold it upon his retirement. During this time, he also had a moonlight gig as a janitor at a JCPenney's. During his working years, he diligently saved and invested in blue chip stocks. Reader's Digest actually dubbed him the blue collar guy with the blue chip smarts, which I actually think is really clever. So kudos to Reader's Digest on that one. By the time he passed away in 2014, at the age of 92, he was worth over $8 million. In the year 2014, 2.8 million people passed away, and less than 4,000 of them had a net worth in excess of $8 million. Ronald was one of them. He left $2 million to his two stepchildren, and the remaining $6 million, he divvied that up between his local library and his local hospital. No one knew of his wealth. Not anyone in his community, not any of his friends, not even his family. He simply lived modestly in a rural town. Next up, we have Theodore Johnson. Theodore worked for UPS for roughly 30 years. At the beginning of his career, he was talking with a friend and he was saying he didn't make enough to save any money. And his friend said you should treat saving like a tax. That is to say, take it out before you even have a chance to spend any of your paycheck, rather than what most people do is take their paycheck and pay all their bills and see what's left over to save. If you go that route, you're probably gonna find that you don't have anything left over to save. Theodore was wise and heeded his friend's advice and he decided to save 20% of his paycheck, every single paycheck. By the time he retired in 1952, he was making $14,000 a year and he had accumulated $700,000 worth of UPS stock. It's important to quickly note that $14,000 a year in 1952 is equivalent to about $150,000 salary in present day. And that $700,000 of UPS stock in 1952 dollars would be the equivalent of roughly $7.5 million in today's dollars. All still extraordinary numbers, but just to give you a bit of context to those. But Theodore's wealth building journey wasn't done simply because he retired. He remained retired for another 39 years. He and his wife continued to live modestly, moving to Florida, buying a two bedroom condo. I feel like there's some kind of unwritten rule that you have to move to Florida once you retire. Maybe that's not the case, but it is for a lot of Michiganders and that's where I'm from. At the age of 91, compounding interest had grown his net worth to over $70 million. That's crazy. A lot happened in Johnson's 91 year lifetime. We had wars, recessions, depressions, heck the computer was created and subsequently the internet was created. And through it all, he remained invested and it paid off. Next up, we have Robert Morin. Robert was the librarian at the University of New Hampshire, a job that he held for almost five decades. He drove an old vehicle, frequently ate TV dinners, attended university sporting events, loved connecting with the university students. He was an avid movie watcher and book reader. It's said that he watched over 22,000 movies and read every single book ever published between the years of 1930 and 1940. Man, he makes me look like a slacker when it comes to reading. And as far as movies go, I know my husband just wishes that I could sit through a movie. I am literally the worst movie watcher in the history of movie watchers. I literally, I can't sit there for two hours and it's an hour and I go stir crazy. I'm up, I'm wandering around, I'm doing anything but watching the movie. I've probably seen like 20 movies in my entire life. We'll go out with a group of friends and they'll be like, you should watch this movie. And my husband will be like, don't bother, don't suggest it. She's not gonna watch it, it's never gonna happen. Sorry. But apparently Robert didn't have this problem. He probably would have watched any movie that was recommended to him. Oh, and there's one more thing worth mentioning about Robert Morin. 
He died in 2015 at the age of 77 with a net worth of over $4 million. He was a very bright man who knew the power of investing and compound interest. He wasn't really interested in the flashy lifestyle, but nonetheless, he had a great deal of wealth. But he was very interested in helping out the University of New Hampshire, his alma mater and his place of employment for almost 50 years. He was very committed to making a difference with the university and with the students. Upon his passing, he earmarked $100,000 to go to the Diamond Library where he worked for those almost 50 years. And the remaining $3.9 million, he said the university would figure out how to spend it. And they did. When he passed away, people were in awe. No one knew his level of wealth. And finally, Richard Fuscone. Richard reached success rather quickly in life. He attended Dartmouth and later Harvard where he earned his MBA. He had a successful career in finance working for the brokerage house Merrill Lynch. So successful actually that he was able to retire in his 40s with the intent of living out the rest of his life as a philanthropist. He was doing fire before fire was actually a thing. Now, Richard had no interest in the modest lifestyle though. He bought himself an 18,000 square foot mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut. The home had 11 bedrooms, two pools, two elevators, seven garages, and cost, oh yeah, about $90,000 per month just to maintain. But it does look pretty epic though. And by the way, that was just one of his homes. In the mid-2000s, he borrowed heavily against his Greenwich home, and then the 2008 financial crisis hit, and he had no income and declared bankruptcy. First, his Palm Beach home was foreclosed upon, and then his Connecticut home. A quick Google search revealed that after declaring bankruptcy, Richard ended his days of living out the fire dream and returned to work. He's back working in the finance field where he is advising people on how to build wealth and hopefully not lose it. So it appears he's landed on his feet and hopefully learned a few lessons along the way. So I guess when it comes to the first picture and the question of which one of these men is a millionaire, the answer is all of them. There's no wrong way to build wealth. You can build it fast, you can build it slow. Most of us take the slow route. Why? Because realistically, it takes time. It takes discipline and dedication. And more often than not, it requires that you flex your patience muscle. I tend to think that the people who build wealth slowly, the ones who watch it slowly accumulate over time, I think they look at wealth a little bit differently and they value money differently rather than someone who accumulates wealth really, really fast. I think the people who accumulate it slowly don't really have an interest in living that flashy lifestyle most of the time. I mean, everyone wants to live their life the way they want to, but generally speaking, I feel like the people who take a lifetime to save it up they've saved it up by living modestly, by living frugally, by living beneath their means. So once they have a million or even several million in the bank, they're not motivated to go out and increase their lifestyle all that much. They're happy with their modest lifestyle. They don't really wanna put on airs. They don't want to go out there and look wealthy. That's not the point of money in their eyes. Money is security. Money is something that you can leave a legacy with rather than something that you can just spend to impress other people. Then you see the people who get a job where they make a boatload of money or they just build their wealth very, very quickly. I feel like those people are more inclined to want to live out that flashy lifestyle, go on expensive vacations, drive that flashy car, because I feel like they don't look at money in the same sense. It's just something that it comes so quickly, so it doesn't hurt to spend it just as easily. When it takes years to build, it might hurt a little bit more to spend it. There's no right or wrong way to live your life or spend your money, it's your life, do what you want with it. But a lot of times, I really think of the wealthy people, they're not out there screaming, hey, I'm wealthy, look at me. Instead, they remind me of the book Millionaire Next Door. They are the people who are silently wealthy and they don't need to draw attention to themselves. Real wealth doesn't have to look like an 18,000 square foot mansion on the ocean. Instead, it could just as easily look like an early retirement and more years spent not worrying about finances and long walks on the beach with your long-term spouse. 
Real wealth does not have to be flashy. These people are all around you. It could be the UPS worker who delivers packages to your door, the librarian who helps you check out a book, or even the clerk at the gas station. They could be super savers. They could have a multi-million dollar net worth simply because they decided to live below their means and invest the difference. You do that for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you're guaranteed to be all set. It's not easy, it's a simple process, but making that choice every single day, day in and day out, yeah, it's a hard choice because sometimes you do want to give in and spend and splurge, but if you constantly do it, you'll be all set for your future. These men are proof of that. And even the last one who lost it all and still landed on his feet, you can lose it all, but it's probably easier and a more enjoyable life experience if you don't have to lose everything you work so hard to create. So I would caution against going the flashy route and spending it all, digging yourself in a hole that you then have to climb out of. Rather, flex that patience muscle and stick to the course. That's gonna do it for me today, guys. I post new videos every single week. If you got anything at all out of this one, please give it a like. If you're new, please consider subscribing, or if you know of someone who might be interested in this type of content, please consider sharing. I hope you have a good one. I'll see you soon. Bye.